Hello, and you are listening to The Book Was Better, the podcast where we talk about the book of the film. I'm Luke Milton. I'm Tim. And this week, we're talking about Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Oh, dear. <laughs> I've got to say with all sincerity that I've been absolutely excited, looking forward uh, to you coming here and doing an episode with you finally, until I uh, found out what we were doing. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I gave, I gave you a couple of choices and then I made the decision and I chose poorly. I've got so much to say about this choice, but uh, before we even do that, I just want to say it's really great to actually have you on the show because you're one of the unsung heroes of Book Was Better. You've done so much work behind the scenes. Uh, you kept all the, the stats, which are very important in keeping as um, honest and legal and yes. uh, meeting all the requirements from the podcasting uh, commission. Oh, yes. They're, they're always on my back, like, telling me, like, make sure they're keeping the swears down. This is a family-friendly show, except sometimes when it's not. But... And, and if people aren't aware of the stats, give us a, a little... Okay, well, this started off, like... Fairly early on. I, I should give credit where credit's due. Lizzie was the one who started doing the stats, and then I just went crazy um, and t- took over and expanded everything. Nobody told me not to, so... <laughs> um, like, my spreadsheet now has about 50 million pages on it because I just kept adding things to track. So, initially, we were tracking the verdict and just seeing whether the book was better um, across each episode because, you know, that's the whole point of the show. And then... After a while, the amount of swearing that Jess and, Jess and yourself did made it interesting. It's like, which episodes are the sweariest? Which books really <laughs> get people's goats? Um, and so we started tracking that, and then just other things kept coming up. Um, you, and you, you've promoted some of that, so the Bergonomics is going to appear in the next round of stats. Um, and we're going to get into some of that today, because even though this is a crazy book, there is a fair amount of Bergonomics coming up. The Burgers have become the um, sort of mascot of the show. Like, I notice in reviews and on our Facebook page, uh, everyone's talking about hamburgers and hot dogs oh. as, and um, the fact that they keep popping up in these movies and that we keep talking about them. They're, they're the new happy dad slap, really. Well, you know, we report the facts. We don't make this stuff <laughs> up. I'm not going to talk about hamburgers if there's nothing to talk about, but... Luckily, uh, there usually is. So I'd be very um, pleased to to see those leak into the spreadsheet. Maybe some pie charts. Oh well, yes, absolutely for, for hamburgers. Yes. So that, you know that's a really good thing. And we just did have a milestone as well. Our Gremlins episode with Lizzie is as long as the film. Yes. So I think it was the Pokemon episode with Xavier and Tom was the first time that the episode was longer than the film itself. Okay, that's but that crazy. was a. That was a really short film. Gremlins yeah. is over an hour and a half long. Yes. And like, I think someone was saying on the Facebook group that um, like you could try syncing it up and doing... Like, see, seeing how much of a commentary track it actually is. Not which, much, yes. I think. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> pretty, pretty out of sync. And um, you also took on the Santa with Muscles <laughs> challenge. You orchestrated that for us. You watched the film so that we didn't have to, and you wrote out the scenes for us to... Um, because it's very important that we didn't see the film. Well, yes. Uh, you, you, you can't see... Like, you can't see the bride before the day of the wedding. You can't see the film before you're, you've written it. Um, but it, it wasn't even that. For, for this show, I did something that you really shouldn't be doing in 2013. I joined a video store <laughs> so I could rent Santa with Muscles. And that is on my permanent record now. So thanks, Luke. And you um, watched it multiple times and wrote out <laughs> scenes. So that was brilliant. And that was one of the favourite episodes, I think, from the feedback that we've had. So that was uh, very good. And... On top of all these things, Tim has um, donated half of the books, at least, that we have. So, And he's you've gotten those from all around the globe as well. Yeah, I, I, I've been on several international trips in the last few years. And last year, I think I came back with about a dozen books from like San Francisco and from the UK. People were looking at me very wor- worryingly when I was going through security, like <laughs> bringing back... Uh, I try to remember some of the ones I brought back. Th- things will never get done on the show, but it just you see the novelization lying around, and you pick it up. So, like, I think fame and an officer and a gentleman. It's, I, it's all Robin fair Hood, game. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. 
All fair game. It'll happen. Yes. Well, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves might actually be next episode. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Spoilers. Uh, but um, Jacinta is really keen. That's one of her favourite films. Oh, excellent. And I've never actually seen it, so um, I'll be watching it very soon. She, well, um, you've, you've heard the song. You've probably seen the video for the yeah. song. Yeah. So we it's the same thing. We were going to on Friday, but then I really <laughs> needed a break after I just read Karate Kid on Sunday. I looked at this this morning, watched the film last night, and... Uh, Wow. So, um, yeah, so look, Tim, uh, no one's more deserving to be, and I would say the co-pilot chair, but um, just in the same way that you have uh, attacked uh, the stats very voraciously and been very thorough with that, um, you read this first, you did the notes, you wrote out the excerpts, and it is very, very thorough. So when I looked <laughs> well, at it you. this morning, I was like, this is so comprehensive. For me to add much more to this would be like taking a couple of grains of sand down to the beach. <laughs> So I'm officially, I'm handing the keys of the show over to you, Tim, and you're going to drive this one, which means you're going to be the one that says, okay, so next up. So then this guy comes into the thing and I'm just going to be sitting there in the passenger seat uh, when I'm not like having my head out the window and my tongue hanging out, hair whipping in the wind. I'm going to be trying to derail you, poking at you, pointing out, reading out signs that I see as we pass. But um, I really missed that. I was saying to Jess, like, I started off as the sidekick, you know. She'd yeah. drive the show and I would just make uh, dumb comments. And um, I just thought, you, you've got such a handle on this. And you've got so much information and research that I'm, I'm going to uh, come along for the ride. Sounds good. I, I, I think I've got a bit of Stockholm Syndrome with this film. Um, same with Sands with Muscles. I watched it I watched it all the way through. I mean, I watched bits of it over and over again. And so Sands with Muscles, I'm pretty sure, is now my favourite film ever. <laughs> and, like, I see... Occasionally, I was re-watching Veronica Mars the other week, and this guy appeared as a supporting character. I was trying to think, well, who's that? Why do I know him? Why do I know him? And about half an hour later, I realised, wait, that's one of the dumb kids from the orphanage in Sansa with Muscles. He still has a career, and he turns up in a show ten years later, and I remember it. You only have to be worried when you start being aroused by Hulk Hogan. <laughs> that's the Cockholm syndrome. Well, <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, I've had that happen when I watch <laughs> something too too often. I'm watching um, a lot of... I'm doing a lot of drawing at the moment, and while I'm drawing, I'm watching uh, Project Runway yep. on Hulu, and I'm thinking, Nina Garcia. Mmm. She's not bad for an old broad. <laughs> Older broad. That's sexist, probably. Um, well, it's, it's setting the tone for the book we're about to discuss. So. Yeah. Okay, so Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. I just want to talk briefly about how confused I am by this, because <laughs> I thought we were doing Yellow Submarine. A, a lot of people have said that to me as well. When I've said, oh, you know the film Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band? They say, oh, yeah, the animated one with the Beatles. Say, no, no, this is worse. This is crazier. Yeah. So I go, all right, it's not the animated one with the Beatles. It's a live action one with the Beatles. Because, you know, Sgt. Pepper's uh, Lonely Hearts Club band, that was uh, an album yeah, for the Beatles. Yeah, and they did like, um, uh, A Hard Day's Night, they did Help, and they yeah. did the Magical Mystery Tour, which are all Beatles albums. So this is a Beatles film, I'm thinking. There's pictures of the people in the uniforms on the front. Uh, it's very hard to see their faces. I'm just glancing at it. I yeah. go, well, it's the Beatles. But, no, it's the Bee Gees. Yes. Next one down in the in the alphabet because the Beastie Boys weren't themed of this uh, weren't formed at this point. So this is a, a Beatles film starring the Bee Gees and Peter Frampton. Yes, um, <laughs> I'm so fucking confused. And then I was like, well, Tim's coming around in the morning. I've left this to the last minute. Last night I thought, you kindly, the whole film is on YouTube. You sent me a link. I thought I'll watch the film and then I can be a bit more skimsy, mcskimsy. <laughs> and uh, there is no dialogue. No. In this film. No, it's, it's a musical. Yeah, George Burns is there to provide um, a bit of narration. Yes. If um, people, like, you know, always think of uh, who's the youngest listener of the show, which is Courtney. You probably won't know who George Burns is. Academy Award winner George Burns. Old man. Used to be in a lot of movies. Always had a cigar, glasses, kind of looks like a chimpanzee. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, George Burns does narration. And otherwise, it's just Beatles songs. Yeah, and, and there's a little bit of text overlaid on like the subtitles like for captioning in the 1920s style. And um, a lot of it is just pantomimed over guitar <laughs> riffs. Yes. And, uh, you know, say what you will about the Bee Gees. They're not particularly strong actors either, so... Uh, yeah, sort of awkward pantomiming. Extremely awkward. Yeah. So um, there's not much of a plot. Uh, it's about a band and their instruments get stolen and um, they have to get them back. 
Well, there's, there's two conflicting plots that don't really make any sense and, in, and don't really intersect very well. Like, stuff happens that has no bearing on the other stuff happening, but it's just there to, f to fill two hours of film and to try and make a narrative out of unrelated Beatles songs. So there's no way a collection of Beatles songs should be turned into a novelization, but it has happened. Yes. And here are the results. So, Tim, wh what's going on here? Well, there's a lot going on, and none of it really deserved to go on at all. Um, so the, the front of the novel claims... Uh, g gives us the... the the spread of from the greatest rock album ever made to the twelve million dollar movie starring Peter Frampton and the Bee Gees. Now a spectacular and fun-filled novel. I actually read that as twelve thousand, and I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that kind that kind of makes sense. Yeah, that that, that would explain a lot more. Um, it probably wouldn't cover the Beatles songs themselves, but um, I think that's where the twelve million comes from. It's just the rights, the rights to the music, and they had like two dollars left for costumes. <laughs> Um, but so, so why does this thing exist? This thing exists because of money. All right. Um, so in the mid-70s, we had films like Saturday Night Fever and Grease, which were musicals which were hugely successful. Yes. And there was a common factor in that, in that the Bee Gees were somehow involved um, in the soundtracks, certainly in Saturday Night Fever. And um, Robert Stigwood was the manager of the Bee Gees at the time. And he liked all this money coming in. Ah. And he somehow got access to like 27 Beatles songs and thought, I like money, people like musicals, maybe I could use these songs, which people love, to get more money for me. And so he commissioned this guy called Henry Edwards to come up with a story that used these songs and then could become a film. And then... For no apparent reason, he decided to cast the Bee Gees as the stars. The Beatles had split up by this point? Yeah, so this is 1978. The Beatles split in 1970. Okay. Um, and I guess at this point, uh, Paul and John were maybe starting to talk to each other again. Um, but this is only two years before John Lennon was shot. Like, there, there, weren't, there still wasn't any reconciliation by all four. So there was no chance of getting all four of them to star in this travesty. I think it's so weird that the Bee Gees like had their own identity and their own music, and for them to want to do this is just really strange to me. Yeah, I imagine that the lure of the money and the pressure from their manager probably convinced them, because I think it, I was reading on IMDb that they realised pretty soon that this was a bad idea and tried to get out of it, um, and weren't able to. So this didn't... did it fare well? No. Okay. No, this fared terribly. It has fared a little bit better in the years since because it has a cult audience for people who like watching this kind of craziness. <laughs> uh, but at the box office, it did not well at all. And Henry Edwards, who um, wrote the screenplay, he was also the writer of this book. Yes, so he, he's, he's had two attempts to get this story right, and I don't think he succeeded in either <laughs> attempt, to be honest. He is not a novelisation writer. He's not a screenwriter either. This was his first film. Okay. He originally was a music critic, I think that's why he got asked, like, you know the music? Here, write a story based on these songs. Um, he has one other film credit on IMDb, which is one of the screenwriters for a film that really deserves a novelization. I hope, I hope it exists, but nobody's probably seen the film, called The Great Skycopter Rescue. Sounds like a challenge. Yes, indeed. Oh, God, don't make me watch this I, one. I love Skycopters, Tim. You've got no idea how much. They're my favourite kind of copter. <laughs> well, I, I watched the trailer for it, and it's basically motorcycle gangs and people in microlights yeah. and things blowing up. Yeah. So, whether... I mean, that, obviously, a three-minute trailer was probably enough. They didn't need to make a film out of it. <laughs> but they did. Um, but then that was, that was his Hollywood career. And okay. since then, he... I think he's been involved in some music books, but... I couldn't really find much on the internet about Henry Edwards. He's seen some films and he's borrowed some books from the library. Yeah. Which, yeah, that's fair enough. And s since 1980, done nothing. Hmm. I mean, there's no bio in the book either, which is interesting. There's nothing saying, how hey... How pets he has. Yeah, or, or how much he loves whale sharks. And, <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's no Alan Dean Foster. But what we get instead, um, and I always like reading acknowledgements in books anyway, because I'm nosy, but we have a dedication in this book... Um, which kind of tells you how bad it's going to be and where Henry Edwards is coming from. So he gets a dedication to his mother and father, his editor and his assistant. 
And my dear friend, Dr. Timothy Leary, who touches every experience with magic. Yeah, and I think this film is a very realistic portrayal of the use of psychedelic drugs in the sense that the person who's doing them thinks they're having a wonderful time and everyone else watching them is bored out of their mind. Yes, absolutely. I, 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 I must admit, I have come to this episode today. Uh, I've just moved out of my apartment. I have been cleaning all morning, so I've been affected by cleaning products. Um, this may make the book seem better in retrospect, <laughs> but we will see. So, um, he was, uh, is it right that he was, like, involved with Timothy Leary then at some point, or...? He certainly seems to have been under his spell. Um, I, I, okay, I did a little bit of rudimentary research a few weeks ago. Research? And, I love this. Yes. Well, it is my job. Yes, yes. Um, not for this. I, I should remind, remind me at the end of the show, I've got an invoice for all these books I've brought you. Okay, excellent. Um, I expect, expect my $2 back. Um, but he, at one point... Edwards wrote a screenplay about Leary's life, um, which I think he wanted Jack Nicholson to play Leary. Um, That didn't get off the ground. But more interestingly, I found the text to Leary's book, The Intelligence Agents, which is really crazy and also just makes stuff up. (laughs) Um, So he talks about synergy and media alchemy, like people essentially not using one media form for their products, but having a story and using merchandise and making a film and a book and the t-shirts and everything out of it. Like, see, so your your product is not restricted to one form. He talks about George Lucas as being a great example of that because he used a half-billion-dollar movie as an advertising trailer for his um, merchandise. Yes. Um, but then he talks about Henry Edwards, um, and this is, in Wikipedia style, this is citation needed for everything because he says... Henry Edwards used a $110 million movie and a $150 million album as promotion for his Pulitzer Prize-winning novel, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And needless to say, and this is obvious once you start reading the novel, this did not win a Pulitzer. Uh, No. No, no, no. All right, Christ. Well, we'd better get into this horrible thing. Yes. So... Ugh. (laughs) It's, Uh. It's ready, it's already. Because we don't even... Like, you think, oh, it's Beatles songs, it's the Bee Gees, we're going to get straight into it, and we don't. No. We'll just read the beginning here. The small provincial town of Pom de la Pom. That's potato of the potato? Apple of the apple. Apple. Okay, south of France. Uh, winter 1915. Yes, remember what happened in France in 1915? This is a happy start. Bombs, death, destruction... Has there ever been a war as fierce as World War I? Has there ever been a battle as severe as the Battle of Pom de la Pom? This battle was as fierce as the Battle of Verdun, as destructive as the Battle of Lenberg, as dangerous as the Battle of Marne, as exhausting as the Battle of the Somme, as gruesome as the Battle of Gallipoli. It was the most severe battle of all. The eyes and ears of the world are focused on this ravaged trench village of Pom de la Pom, whose houses and barns have toppled to the ground, and whose once lush fields have now turned to mud. Determined to fight to the death to gain control of Pom de la Pom, the alleys and the axes have relentlessly used guns, tanks, grenades, as well as all other horrors of modern warfare to annihilate the other side. Each day at the crack of dawn, they would stealthily crawl toward each other. Their teeth clenched, their eyes narrowed to tiny slits. They would get so close they could smell each other's sweat. Too close. They would retreat back until they were far enough away to begin again. Gain an inch. Lose an inch. No wonder the fighting had raged on for 21 long days and 21 even longer nights. Okay, look, this goes on, but spoilers, and this amuses me at the film, the whole uh, weapon, to secret weapon to fix the war is a um, really fruity marching band. Yes. And in the film, you do have this, like, war-torn city and then these guys come out in their Sergeant Pepper's outfits playing uh, these songs. It's crazy. Yeah, and, and all the soldiers from both sides just lay down their weapons and start dancing and joining in. It's... And, yeah, and that pretty much sets the tone yes. for what we're about to uh, commit to here. So Sergeant Pepper helps to bring about the end of World War I and goes back to America because Sergeant Pepper is American. Everybody is American in this film. Yeah. The Beatles, Liverpudlians, no, nah, forget about it. We, we're going Even the to, Beatles are American. Yeah, we're going to hometown America here. He goes home and gets rewarded with the Purple Staff for Distinguished Music Making in the Line of Duty, which really should not be a... It's a very specific and really should not be a medal at all. And he gets presented <laughs> by the Chiefs of Staff. Purple Staff. Yeah, he gets presented in Paris. Um, he, he has his Purple Staff out on display for everyone to admire. As you do. Yes. And he goes home to Heartland, which is a small town somewhere in the US. It's 
Middle America. It does, there's no real description other than, really, it sounds like Stepford Hell. Um, they have a motto of kindness above all else. There's houses with white picket fences. In each Heartland yard, there was one large tree with a tree house on top of it, built by a Heartland dad. In each basement was stored an ice cream freezer, packed filled with homemade peppermint ice cream, Heartland's favourite summertime treat. So we go straight into the junk food. Even though this is a supposedly wholesome town, we've got the ice cream coming out. I like that they um, all have the just that one flavour. Yes. Because I've often thought that about America with their um, best country in the world thing. It's kind of like someone who's had chocolate ice cream, really likes chocolate ice cream kind of vaguely knows that there are other flavours of ice cream around, but it's just, like, had such a good experience with it. They're like, chocolate ice cream is the best! That's the only ice cream! It's the best ice cream ever! And other people are having, like, rum and raisin and having cookie dough and having all these crazy things. And, you know, maybe, like, chocolate's still good or whatever, but, like, you just think, there are lots of other ice creams to try. Like, why do you just want to have that one? And, and like, you've got no knowledge of those other things. Well, it's, it's one of those you, you can only be good at one type of ice cream forever and ever. That's, that's true. It. You, you're set in, you've, you've excelled at this path, that's it now. Peppermint, in Heartland's case. Yes. They, they, there must be something they add to it. And Some I, hallucinogenic. And I do like this, um, a description of Heartlanders. At the moment of birth, each had been kissed instead of slapped, and each had grown up to be their neighbour, need ever ask for help. Yeah. They're supposedly this really nice bunch of people who are just kind and looking out for everybody. Probably really nosy as well, because like, I would not know if my neighbours were doing anything whatsoever. Like They would have to come... If they needed my help, they would have to come bleeding and knock on the door, probably wake me up, convince me of their need for um, action. You could uh, certainly spot all the doctors and midwives by the amount of after afterbirth crusted around their chins. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> Oh dear. So uh, we meet Mr. Kite. Yes, yeah, so one of the things that you'll notice with this book and film is that the Beatles songs that they have managed to get the rights for set, set up which characters they have, and so they're shoehorned in as much as they can. Um, so obviously we're going to get being for the benefit of Mr. Kite a bit later. Um, Mr. Kite is played by George Burns, and at the end of World War I, um, when, we first, when we first meet... Mr. Kite and Sergeant Pepper, he's just become mayor. Um, he had been elected on the progressive ticket and had run on a platform of more sunshine, love, and kindness, which is exactly what people wanted during World War I. And then somehow, as we find in the coming pages, he kept his office through the Depression, through World War II, presumably without changing his platform or delivering any promises whatsoever. Politics. I feel like uh, Mayor McCheese <laughs> had more solid uh, policies than uh, Mr. Kite. Well, they weren't cheese whiz, so... <laughs> cheese related. Um, um, and so we, we still don't meet anyone who's actually in the film other than Mr. Kite. Like, we're still with the original Sergeant Pepper. Throughout, like, we get the history of the first half of the 20th century in Heartland as told by Ms., uh, Sergeant Pepper's actions. So told get, in real time. Yeah, it, it, it is, this section goes forever in both book and film <laughs> and it's all soundtracked to various arrangements of the song Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band so this is the first five ten minutes of the film and it just drives you insane like just that same little melody line in different arrangements just on and on and on first five ten minutes of the film and the first 25 minutes of our podcast yes. <laughs> sorry about that um, but finally, we something happens. We, okay. We, it's, it's 1956, the 16th of August, and finally, Heartland, like, Sergeant Pepper's stopped World War II as well by this point, and Heartland finally realises, hey, we should probably thank this guy. So we're going to put up a weather vane in his honour. That seems fitting. Yeah. And um, th this weather vane would always point the way to happiness. Yeah. That's not how weather vanes work. And also... There's a flaw in their plan, because weather vanes point away from stuff. Like, it's not going to be pointing towards Heartland, it's going to be pointing away from it. I'm assuming it was always pointing to the cinema's exit. <laughs> yes. And it changes halfway through, so it's giving you both exits, so you know, <laughs> don't all rush out through this one. <laughs> yeah. um, but then we find out, like, on the day that the weather vane is un unveiled, we find out that for all its wonderfulness, its loving and caring nature, Heartland is full of people who just don't understand death, consequences, or how to respond to emergencies. Sergeant Pepper bowed back. 
He would repay his friends and neighbours for their lifelong love and devotion by playing rock and roll as it had never been played before. The first number had hardly begun when the sergeant began to waver. He clutched his heart. He fell to his knees. Not our Sergeant Pepper, gasped the crowd. They buried their faces in their hands. When they had gathered up enough courage to look up, Sergeant Pepper lay on the ground dead. So I'm assuming here that since nobody actually rushed to give assistance, uh, presuming that they didn't actually have a doctor or a hospital nearby, the Heartlanders just spent an awkward half an hour peeking through their fingers asking, is he dead yet? <laughs> and yeah, this is so much for being there before a neighbour need even ask for help crap. I don't know, it's just like, you know how they kiss instead of spank? I'm thinking instead of CPR, the Heartland doctors were trained to tease the patient's nipples while kissing <laughs> them on the mouth. And even that just didn't get him going. <laughs> Poor Sergeant Pepper. But uh, look, the actual story now finally starts to kick in. Finally. <laughs> finally. So give us a, a, a summation here. Okay, so Sergeant Pepper died, and everybody's sad. Although in the film, it's pretty good, because Sergeant Pepper dies, and then we cut back to George Burns in his office, and he says, oh well. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, dead it. good work. Um, so in his will, he leaves his instruments to the town, and apparently these are magic instruments? that have the power to make dreams come true and will leave Heartland happy as long as the instruments are in the town. If they're gone, they could be used to realise evil dreams and be used to make mischief and things like that. Um, and then... It's the plot of Avengers 2, I believe. Yes. <laughs> they're going to also turn up in Heartland. <laughs> yeah. And it... Oh, God, can you imagine... Like... Colson on the phone going, we found something, and there's this like glowing saxophone <laughs> in, a, in a crater in Nevada. <laughs> I'm just imagining now, like, Thor and Captain America forming their own lo Lonely Hearts Club band. Oh, well, you know, they like wearing uniforms. Yeah. Fruity uniforms. <laughs> it's, uh, it could happen. Get Joss Whedon on the phone now. Yeah. Um, but then Sergeant Pepper also takes it far. Like, he, he thinks that he has the ability to decree what everybody should do in their future forever in his will. Because he puts ridiculous pressure on his grandson, Billy Shears. And, like, for those of you who have your encyclopedia knowledge of the Beatles songs, you know what's coming next. Um, Billy Shears is a kid, is his grandson, but he's been told by Sergeant Pepper to form a new band when he grows up with his three best friends, who are also brothers, who are also, like, tiny. And also Bee Gees. Well, yeah. They're not the Bee Gees yet, but they will be. They will be. And, obviously, this is assuming that nobody ever drifts apart and hates their friends from, like, their friends when they were friends when they were six. Now they're 15, and they hate each other. It's like an arranged marriage. Yes. Uh, and this is that classic quest item story that you basically do when you don't have a story. Like, if you, you know, when you're sitting in a film and they go, okay, there's X amount of items that are scattered across in these, you know, I mean, fuck Rowling did it with Harry Potter. Yeah. That are scattered in these different locations and uh, you'll go there and interact with these zany people in each place and it's like, then it's the end. Yes. And uh, that's pretty much where we're going from, from now on. Yeah, it, it reminded me actually of, of Sands with Muscles as well in that there is... Just, just stuff happens, and it doesn't make any sense. It's just episode after episode after episode, and eventually there's this major plot point that actually means nothing, but is supposed to be significant. I, and obviously, all films I see now are filtered through sounds with muscles. So yeah, yeah. Like, so this may just be me. It's the litmus test. Yes. So with Sergeant Pepper dead. Um, the town sets up a Sergeant Pepper museum. Mm. Yeah, you know, the thing they could have done to honor him instead of putting up a stupid weather vane. And they make Mr. Kite the museum guard. So this is the guard. He's not the curator or the director or anyone with any power, well, with any responsibility for the museum and what it does, like organizing activities. He's the guard as well as the mayor. And he believes it's an honor, but really. I think this is what you get when you don't deliver more sunshine. Yeah, you're in the museum at 3am stopping um, tiny Owen Wilson from yes. uh, having a fight with tiny Steve Coogan. But uh, <laughs> what's in the museum? What's in the museum, you ask? Well, photos? Sergeant Pepper's first shoes, his high chair, his baby bib, his toothbrushes, his lunchboxes. All the usual wonderment. Here are the sheets from Sergeant Pepper's first wet dream. It was about a unicorn. Oh dear. Happened on top of a rainbow. Proudly displayed, just stretched out, <laughs> stretched the wall. With uh, a Sharpie's drawn around the oh, no. points of interest. <laughs> they, they get one of the kids to just draw a, a recreation of the, of the dream. Yeah, I guess you wouldn't, like, use a Sharpie on such a sacred object. I think the mayor must come in with a laser pointer. Oh, no. <laughs> just uh, over oh. here. Oh, Luke, what have you done? Yeah. But obviously, I mean, we're still in, I don't know, 
chapter one and it's been 500 pages um, <laughs> and we still haven't met anyone like Sergeant Pepper's dead but Billy and the Hendersons are still kids um, or not a Sasquatch um, and they still have to grow up before we know if they'll start a new Lonely Hearts Club band um, but spoiler like there is so much left in the book it's obviously they probably will I really really wish right now that this was Harry and the Hendersons it would make a much better film yeah All right, imagine, so the- imagine Harry doing Beatles songs <laughs> So we're 24 pages in, feels like 240, Yes. and we finally get to the present day. And it's fair day too, so you know what this means? It means that there's plenty of scope for scene setting and padding, so it's still another five pages before we get to a song. Yeah, and they just write out the lyrics, Yeah. which um, a lot of novelizations in the past that are based on musicals struggle to try and make it part of the scene. In yeah. this, uh, no, we just get the lyrics. Yeah, I think I think that's partly because these are obviously songs that existed before the film. So the songs were written, they could just shoehorn them in wherever. Whereas the High School Musical, for instance, they might have still been tinkering with the lyrics yeah, when, no, the, that's when the book true. was being written. Um, but here, it's like Beatles songs. Everybody could sing them from memory anyway. And, and tell us about this really unusual style that this book is written in. Okay, so Henry Edwards has his own funny approach to writing which I personally disliked. For the first chapter he's talking about stuff that's happened in the past and so he writes it as you would normally um, for most novelization writers. We get to the present day and you can tell it's the present day because he's writing in the present tense. Yeah. It's a little disorienting at the start and then it just gets annoying. It's Um, more like somebody um, telling you like something that happened on the weekend kind of thing. You know, and then so-and-so, he gets up and he says that kind of thing. Yeah, and just that's it for the rest of the book now. It's that style. He also, the next, the, the first five pages of this chapter, he establishes Heartland by giving everybody a name and a backstory. Um, like, you could, if you had enough information here, you could do a whole town census from the book. Sounds like a project. <laughs> Like you could probably draw a map as well, and I would be up for that. <laughs> yeah. Like he he does give a, he does give a full description of what where each building is. Um, I think he probably had the whole project like mapped out, blueprints for all the buildings, secret passages, created a model. Yeah, possibly while on drugs. Like no, not even possibly while on drugs. Um, so everybody in this chapter is referred to as profession name or adjective name. So we get librarian Richard, postman Hank, lovely Sylvia. Teacher Ellen. Um, so Sylvia was unemployed. Clearly. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. She she was just hanging around, um, and he has favourite adjectives as well. And and this he, blew my mind. He uses them all the time, and it's just bizarre. All of the youngish kids and teens are either brash or brashy if they're boys, or silly if they're girls. <laughs> and that's it. Example: the brashy boys blow up hundreds of balloons. The silly girls dress up their kisses for sale booth with a coat of fresh pink paint. And that even Mr. Kite talks like this in the book. Like, Do you remember last year's fair? Brash Peter was tired, tired of trying to win Silly Mimi a stuffed teddy bear. Can you imagine the conversations if like everyone grows up and continues to be brash or silly? Oh. Like Dad going, peas? I don't want peas. Why don't we just have ice cream for dinner? And Mum going, I met my pee-pee. <laughs> <laughs> this is why... Heartland is an isolated community. <laughs> they have no interaction with outsiders. They never get posts. They never get telegrams. That's because everybody else in America is just turning their back on them. Yeah. Um, this is a nice little uh, quote. I've never seen such a huge watermelon, Teacher Ellen tells Farmer Chris. It's as juicy as it is big, Chris beans back like a slice. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of these possibly deliberately awkward interactions amongst the townspeople, which obviously don't appear in the film whatsoever. Um, We don't know anything about the town. Um, But there's a lot of nudge-nudge, wink-wink, check-out-my-vegetables kind of thing. Ellen's huge melons. Yes. Well, she's a teacher, but she probably came up with the slogan. That's very true. Probably sells melons in her spare time. Yes. The other benefit of the fair, apart from we get to meet everybody in the town because we really wanted to, um, is we can start some of our favourite statistics, um, the Bergonomics. So at this point, we still have had no story. No. We have, we've just been ploughing on through. But at the fair, we get all the threads coming together in terms of the stuff we actually care about. Peter can't find Mimi, but he does find some hot buttered corn. Brashy hands flips pizzas in the air as silly Carrie waits anxiously. She drools for the pizza and she drools for hands. 
Brashy Jack suddenly grabs the pizza from her mouth and she begins to chase him. Not uncommon for an American to snatch the food from uh, somebody else's mouth. Yep. It's, well, I think it's flirting. Yeah. Yep. You'll often see um, uh, sort of like what happens in the Black Friday sales, but, uh, you know, a family fighting over the last slice of pizza yep. in a public place. But uh, look, finally, we, we, finally. We, we get to meet the actual characters, right? Yeah. It's 36 minutes in. 36 minutes in, we, we, we've got the, the music starts at this point, um, and we're basically doomed from here on in. I noticed you said that, you know, we could put some descriptions here, but like, fuck, let's have Bee Gees. Everyone <laughs> knows what the Bee Gees look like. They look like beards <laughs> with uh, floppy hair on top. Yeah, so, certainly Barry Gibb is all hair in this film. It's pretty impressive. Looks like uh, Grug. <laughs> He's also in in that '70s style. When when they're doing the first number, he's got the big shirt that's open all the way down to the waist. It's like, oh, it's very very difficult to work out. I was trying to find that line where his chest hair ends and his pubic hair begins, but it all <laughs> just kind of blended. Yes, um, and so we they they sing songs like it's introducing the band, and nobody actually cares. Um, like they, they're meant to be this wonderful band that everybody's crazy about, but to be honest. The music and the band are one of the least interesting things about this book. Yeah. Well, like the uh, the girlfriend here, she's introduced. Yes. Billy's girlfriend is called Strawberry Fields. Oh, let's see what they did there. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, so, again, you know what song's coming. Um, yeah. You know, like, I, no shit. When I was um, young and in film school, I really fantasised about making a They Might Be Giants <laughs> Like with characters like Chess Piece Face and the Rabid Child. Yeah, like having a hotel detective in there. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Well, they would probably be hotel detectives. Yeah, you apart know, from the one who's like an angel. A mystery, yeah. And, and you think, oh, it's such a good idea at, at that age. And then you yeah. see that in 78 they did it with Beatles songs and it sucked <laughs> shit. <laughs> it really did. All right. Uh, Mr. Kite's got a song. Yeah, so what in the film, once the music starts, it's pretty much song, 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 song. And that's it. Like, overlaying some attempt at plot but not really so we go from the Sgt Pepper's band whatever playing a song to Mr Kite fantasising about being a rocker so he this is the problem I have as well with the film and with the whole project is that they get the rights to all these Beatles songs and so they have some of the big ones everybody knows and then they're stuck with a lot of other ones that they just have to shoehorn in wherever so Mr Kite rocks out to fixing a hole which I don't think is anybody's favourite song on Sgt. Pepper. It's not one you go to regularly. It's just there. Um, and it's really creepy when he's doing it on, on the film, in the film in particular, because he's like hanging out with two young girls who are about six or seven. Yeah, when you say young girls, you really mean young girls yeah. there. And so when, when you watch the film and then you come back to the description in the book, it's just really creepy which is Bonnie gets down on one knee oh please mayor baby one more song one more tune for old time's sake that's a sassy six year old <laughs> yeah look but forget the kids I just love fixing a hole as a euphemism like why are you so happy oh Jenny's back from a trip overseas and I'm fixing a hole tonight <laughs> oh jeez well I mean on there, there are accusations that fixing a hole was essentially about heroin um rather than like I know doing some DIY or anything so <laughs> so there's that side of it as well, which is also a little bit creepy when he's hanging out with six-year-olds. It's fixed. It's unfixed. It's fixed. It's unfixed. It's fixed. It's unfixed. Uh, Mayor Baby, one more. <laughs> the band gets a telegram from LA All saying, right. from a record company, like, Big Deal Records. Yeah. Because, of course. Best it's, kind of records. Yeah. Um, and the, the head of BD Records, just in case you really wanted to know, is played by Donald Pleasance. Um, British actor was Blofeld. In Bond films. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's the one with the white cat. Um, he gets to play a record company director and sing and dance, and God knows how much he was paid for it, but clearly it wasn't enough. <laughs> um, so the record company tells the band, hey, we, we've heard that you're good. Send us a tape, and we could make you stars. Um, and so they, they do this, they send the tape, and immediately get a telegram back because this is how telecommunications worked in 1978 as well. Yeah, the, saying, tele the telegrams went... This exchange went from 1978 to 1981. Yes. Um, saying, yeah, we, we, we love your music. Stop. Please come sign with us. Stop. We will make you stars. We expect you tomorrow. Stop. <laughs> um, of course. So everybody... All the parents who we get backstories for again here, 
are worried that, like, oh, but LA, it's dangerous, it's corrupt, it's going to ruin our kids if they leave this lovely town. So the Henderson parents worry about floods, um, because that's, and smog and things, and then, have you considered drugs? They don't eat dinner in LA, they smoke it. Um, which, considering some of your food options coming up, might not be a bad idea anyway. I've definitely seen uh, Americans inhale (laughs) a burger before. Um, I've been watching on Hulu Plus Cake Boss, Mm-hmm. Because um, Paul F. Tompkins, the comedian yes. on uh, Comedy Bang Bang Often, uh, which is a podcast a lot of people who are listening right now um, or listen to our show would rather be listening to, um, has uh, he play he pretends to be Cake Boss, who yeah. has a reality show, Big New Jersey Baker. Well, I I, do, I I sometimes forget that Cake Boss is a real thing. It's I just assume thing. it's a Paul F. Tompkins yeah, character. Yeah, no, it's this real like thing. Herzog. And uh, in every, like, half-hour episode, there's usually multiple cakes, multiple storylines, and they're interwoven. And I swear, with zero irony, this is just the state of America. They're making a cake for the Cancer Foundation, Mm -hmm. and they're remembering people that they've lost, um, people that have worked in the bakery, fathers, brothers, etc., to to cancer. Um, So that's quite serious. But in the same episode, they're making a giant cake shaped like a hamburger. (laughs) And all of the um, bakers decide to have a hamburger eating contest and they eat like 20 burgers each oh, no. with no mention of the health ramifications <laughs> or any, in the same episode where they're talking about people they've lost from cancer. Oh, they are eating 20 hamburgers each in a competition and there's no, and it's all like straight faced and naturalized. Wow. Yeah. That's your country, America. <laughs> well, it's like all the, all the ads for pharmaceuticals in America. The, the disclaimer about all the side effects goes longer than the actual ad for the thing that's meant to be good. Well, I'm seeing all these American ads now on Hulu, and there was one about, um, you know, these people going ovarian cancer, and then the line would go through it, and all these people that had beaten cancer, and it was for some cancer centre, but it had this really aggressive American kind of, like, we get rid of more cancer than anybody else, we kick cancer in the nuts kind of thing. You could never imagine an ad like that being on Australian no. television. Like, we will cure your cancer better than anyone else can cure your cancer. We kick cancer in its cancery throat. <laughs> well, um, that's a safe strategy, at least. i uh, got to ask you a question. What is love? Well, other than the obvious answer of, well, Hadaway would know. Um, it, according to Henry Edwards, Sylvia has once again caught the eye of banker Tom. He offers to share his apple cider with her. They take alternate sips. Suddenly, they're in love. <laughs> uh, these small towns have their homebrew drugged ciders. The magic of a hypnol. Yes. Well, we're going to get more of that later as well. All right. Well, here's a favourite character. Uh, Miss, <laughs> Mr. Mustard. Yeah. Played for no real reason by Frankie Howard. I don't know who Frankie Howard is. Frankie Howard is a British guy. He appears in Carry On films. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not, he's not Sid James and he's not Kenneth Williams. So Sid James is very... I know Sid James. And yeah. Kenneth Williams is very... Um, so he's sort of in the between? Yeah. He's, he's a bit... Arr, 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 arr. Yeah, pretty much. He yeah. gurns a lot and he gets to gurn a lot in this. I love um, gurning. I yeah. always say, whenever we say the word gurning, if you don't know what gurning is, Google image search it and just that'll be your afternoon. Yes. He'll fall, fall down the YouTube hole if you start watching gurning <laughs> videos. Um, he has very expressive eyebrows. The um, best gurners can uh, like put their entire nose in their mouth. <laughs> a nondescript mustard-coloured van climbs to the top of Heartland Hill and proceeds slowly, one wheel at a time, from side to side like a cat stalking its prey. On its side are stenciled the words, Mustard Real Estate. The van continues its climb, belching yellow exhaust fumes all the while. With each belch, it makes an eerie moan of delight. How much fun it is to pollute such a clean, clean landscape. So two points there. For a nondescript van, that's a fair bit of unique description. It's pretty vivid. And then also, so we don't have a protagonist in this film, but I'm pretty sure this is the first vantagonist. Yeah, like how often did you watch the A-Team and wonder, like, what is the van thinking? Oh. So he's thinking, rrr, rrr, <laughs> I'm going to kill all them terrorists. I'm surprised that more TV shows and films haven't followed in Knight Rider's wake. Yeah. Like, like, the car was the star. Let's just go with that. I, I so want to make like a um, 80s style kind of sex comedy where it's like a shag and wagon that <laughs> um, is, is like talks and thinks. I'm, I'm imagining Air Force One from the perspective of Air Force One now. So, yeah. So when Harrison Ford says, get off my plane... Like, Air Force One says, 
Well, no, hang on. Let's just talk it through a bit. Okay? <laughs> just sit him down the back, give him some peanuts. Maybe Gary Oldman will calm down. The plane's like, I feel so violent. <laughs> Do you know how hard it is to carry you all inside me every day? So um, what's Mr. Mustard all about? Well, you'd hope, really, with a name like Mustard, he's all about the Bergonomics. Yes. And thankfully, he does not disappoint. Excellent. Mr. Mustard checks out the terrain. He loves what he sees. What a lovely place for the Mustard Industrial Park, the Mustard Shopping Centre, the Mustard High-Rise Apartment Complex, the Mustard Slum. (laughs) What? Um, And especially Mr. Mustard's Greasy Mustard Burger Stand. Mustard munches on a hot dog drenched with mustard. He wipes the mustard drippings onto the sleeve of his mustard-coloured jacket. Yummy, yummy. And I'm watching so many uh, fast food commercials on Hulu, and man, like, I found in all commercials in general, Americans like screaming. Like, they think (laughs) that's a a good trait, like, that a character will go, like, come on, get some something or other, and, and, like, that's appealing, not obnoxious or anything. It's Mm -hmm. like, yeah, that that makes me want to buy that thing. I want to buy what you're screaming at me to buy. And there's lots with, like, um, that my favourite, so there's a KFC one, where they get this um, family get a 10-piece and the mum's like, oh, it's my day off. Like, yeah. I, I get the day off and um, today I'm not mum, I'm just like Barbara or whatever. Can you believe we got a lemon cake for free? <laughs> I know, seriously, it's just like the best thing that's ever happened to this family is eating this horrible chicken. And um, there's a KFC one where they're doing the double down, which is the bacon oh. and cheese in between the... Um, well, that's a war crime right there. Yeah, in between the two bits of chicken. And these it's just these, like, young sort of 20-something hipster guys just screaming at each other <laughs> about how much they love to, like, stuff their faces with bacon and chicken. It's so gross. The other thing I got from that excerpt was just... It's one, it's one of those examples where you say the word so many times, in this case mustard, but it just loses all meaning. You forget what it's actually about. Like, mustard, mustard, mustard. You think, wait, mustard is awful. Why would why would you want a world of mustard? Seriously, it's... Ugh. I hope his mustard coloured jacket had greaseproof fry pockets. I'm sure it did. I'm sure he was prepared. It must have been long, <laughs> but it's over <laughs> me. <laughs> and that's really what it's all about. That's what it is. That is love. All right. Um, Digital love. Yeah, so Mr. Mustard in the book, is accompanied by three computerettes. Mm. Like, three little robots. In the film, we only get the two of them, and they're, like, clearly people in shiny suits with yeah. wires coming out of their head. I have some things to say about them. Yeah. Um, and But this is... Very, like, you thought Flubber was bad with um, how much the robot there was in love with Robin Williams. Um, but this is worse. And also, like, this is the 1970s. Henry Edwards is deliberately doing this. He is playing this angle up as much as he wants. Like, he's really into this craziness. Um, so we he find out... He wants must- to stick his floppy in the slot. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, it would have been floppy at this time as well. <laughs> um, we find out that Mustard wants to take over Heartland, and he even had a team to help. Irma, Barbara, and Martha. Made of transistors, nuts and bolts, with light bulb eyes, wire spring hair, and amplifier mouths, they were the most adorable computerettes he'd ever seen. These computer cuties have been assembled out of nuts and bolts right before Mustard's eyes. And to be honest, I stopped there when I was writing out the notes because this goes for like a page and I could have written out the whole thing because it's all about knobs and twisting things and how much each of the three computerettes adores Mustard and wants to be his wife. And it's all just so creepy. They are really creepy in the film. They're like these sort of black bug-like robots with glowing eyes that um, flip around all over the place and hooker wigs. Yeah, Awful. Uh, they, they don't play the sexiness up as much in the film, probably because they didn't have the budget to make it look sexy. But in in the book, it's just full on. They, they, they are interested in anybody and everybody. And uh, um, you picked up uh, an interesting little thing here. Yeah, I, I, I am always on the lookout for anagrams and codes and things because that's just how my brain is wired. Um, so in the film, the computer rates are not named. So Edwards can do what he wants in the book. Um, so he's slightly named for computerettes Irma, Barbara, and Martha, or IBM. Very clever. For some value of clever, anyway. Yeah, no, I like that. Um, and there's a lot of deliberate, possibly deliberate, anyway, or inadvertent foodie stuff here, um, which is unsurprising given that you're stuck with the names that you have the rights for. So they talk, they say mustard honey a lot. It's like, that's not a good combination. No. Um, and we come back... 
So earlier we had the uh, everyone is brashy or silly. A lot of the adult characters are either pretty grotesque or they're a cutie. Yeah, so many cuties in this film. It's kind of including um, the Bee Gees. That's how I separate people. Yes. Actually, in terms of my level of interest. <laughs> yes. We find out that hey, there is so much nonsensical plot here. So I apologise for just going on and on about trying to set up the story because the story is useless. Uh, but Mustard works for the mysterious FBB, who is some sort of cult leader to whom he has pledged undying loyalty because he was a loser, basically. And then he could change his life because of this cult. So why not? I, this is like, if Timothy Leary comes knocking on your door, why not? <laughs> the message appears on the screen. It is the slogan of the movement. Time once again to pledge one's loyalty, something that happens three times daily. We hate love. We hate joy. We love money. Remember, losers can be winners. The four of them jump up and down. It's a dream come true. By the time they're done, the slogan will be more popular than plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief it is. And that's a real slogan. I watched this on YouTube. You gave me the link. And what the (laughs) fuck did I watch? Like, there's this little creepy stop motion, howdy doody kind of thing with an aspirin for a head that sings <laughs> plop plop fizz fi- oh no didn't make me happy no it's and a, i was already not happy <laughs> yeah it's like a 1950s ad for alka seltzer um check it out on youtube because i had to check that this wasn't just henry edwards being insane google uh, plop plop fizz fizz yeah don't image search though no no so t- turn all your filters on before you <laughs> do anything here make sure the nsa aren't tracking you and we also get more cre- more creepiness here. Uh, Mustard, uh, so the band are r- playing in the barn, and Mustard spies on them, and then he spots Strawberry through his video screen. Mr. Mustard drools uncontrollably. So sweet, so naive, so ripe. Mustard smacks his lips. He moans as he pushes the computerettes away and jiggles the periscope himself to ensure the best view. Yeah, you really want to picture Frankie Howard jiggling his periscope at While this point. While moaning, no yes. less. Ugh. And uh, this is the... It's kind of sad about this book because it means that there's less material for us um, in this regard. There's not a great deal of inadvertent double entendre here uh, because it's all deliberate single entendre and really inappropriate. It's just all deliberately wanting to be sexy and not being sexy. It's pretty foul. We then cut to LA where we meet B.D. Brockhurst, the owner of Big Deal Records, um, his offsider who doesn't appear in the film, so to hell with him, and Lucy who is the leader of the girl group, Lucy and the Diamonds. I see what they did there. Yeah. Hope she goes in the sky at some point. Don't worry. (laughs) (laughs) No spoilers. Relax. Um, She'll she'll be there. Yeah. And we get backstories for all of them, of course, but this is what we learn about Lucy, um, because Luke's first question about any female character, obviously, is, is she hot? Is she hot? Uh, this Look, this is my favourite bit in the book. I need to read this because <laughs> yeah. this is just brilliant. Lucy is so hot that steam pours onto BD's contact lenses whenever he looks at her. With skin like spun silk, lips like melting cherries, and eyes as piercing as those of a leopard in the night, Lucy is more woman than any man can handle. When she was born, she had been so hot that the doctors had passed her back and forth in order not to burn their hands. Vapours of hot steam used to cloud her nursery window, and boy babies would struggle to crawl from their cribs towards her. Oh my god, what the hell? (laughs) I hate this film and book, but that is the best description of a female character that we have ever had on the show. That's the one to top right now. I love that so much, and that's the hottest baby I've ever heard about. Yeah, I've never heard of a baby having that effect on other babies. That that made other babies have (laughs) puberty in their cribs. Yeah, like... Also, just huge developmental leaps. Like, if they're still in the hospital, they can't crawl yet. They don't know what's going no. on, but no, no, here we go. They were trying. Some magnetic effect here. Whoa. Yeah. So the band gets a telegram from BD saying that he's offering them his contract if they turn up in LA immediately. Like, so he doesn't care that much. Um, and they'll be superstars. Um, and we get a lot of stupid slapstick here. We get an octogenarian postman with false teeth whose teeth fall out with the telegram between them um, when he's delivering the telegram. And all this stuff doesn't appear in the film, but we get stuff like Bob uses Charlie's teeth as castanets as Dave begins to dance with a cow. Of course he does. And Such an easy thing to do in a novelization too. Yep. Oh, and then they danced with a cow. Yep. And all, all the animals fall in love as well because they drink the cider and... For some reason, they have a whole bunch of kids have a shoe polish fight, like just throwing mm, shoe polish at mm. each other. 
because all the girls are in love with the band, so they're doing things like shine their shoes, because that's what you do. So, yeah, yeah. Good. Mm. If anyone would like to shine my shoes, uh, send me a private message. <laughs> Gross. Um, we get Dougie dreaming of being a famous and rich manager, because he, Dougie, if you recall, is Billy Shears' half-brother or whatever, and he's evil. Um so he likes money. He loves money, yes. Um, he has no talent, but he loves money, so he's going to use the band to become rich. Um, so he, he wants to be a, a rich manager, and we get a lot of wishful thinking on Edwards's part here of who he wants to be in the film. Um, we get Elton John, Fleetwood Mac, Earth, Wind & Fire, and Stevie Wonder all begging Dougie to manage them. Um, apart from Earth, Wind & Fire, who do sing later on in the film, none of them appear here. No, could not get them. No. I, this, again, you had two dollars left over from buying all the rights. <laughs> you stuck with who you've got. Twelve thousand dollar movie. Yes. And finally, I, we. I, this is still. The book is still fairly early on at this point because we haven't had the worst of the plot yet. The band finally go to LA, and Mustard is happy because it means he can make his move on Strawberry. And I'm pretty sure that this whole plot line is set up just so that Henry Edwards can use this line. Goodbye, Billy Shears, Mr. Mustard says gleefully as the truck rolls off, and good morning, Strawberry Mustard. Of all the terrible-sounding concoctions mentioned in previous episodes, if anyone finds Strawberry Mustard in their local supermarket, I do not want to know. One day, America is just going to grind all the foods into a thick paste and have it piped into their homes like electricity <laughs> or the internet, is my theory. Oh, I like vacuum tubes. Mm. Just, oh, right, oh. right into their body. Yeah, all, all, all of those fancy houses in TV would have instead in the bath they have like a champagne tap. <laughs> it's gonna be your mustard tap. Well, someone uh, put on the Facebook page a, a pizza which had fried chicken crust. I mean, once oh, you start what? trying to eat your fried chicken and your pizza at the same time, you may as well just put everything into a paste and uh, <laughs> put a pipe in your mouth. Well, that's, that's how space food works, isn't it? That's the logic. Like you just. Na- Get rid of everything that's nutritious about it. Just get it down into a basic form that you can eat mm. in space. Right? Why not do that for regular food as well? So what happened in Wally? Something like that. Yeah, pretty sure. Why yeah. not? Yeah. Who's going to fact check us? <laughs> well, not me. I'm here. That's true. We're safe. <laughs> yes. I could say what I like. We're starting to move. Now that we've got actual grown-up characters and ladies appearing, Henry Edwards gets to be gets to move towards sexy stuff, um, mm, which yeah. is a regrettable move. Um, so it's the 70s. And whenever, whenever I watch a film in the 70s, because I saw so much 70s porn, I expect <laughs> everyone to start taking off their clothes. So this was where I actually started to feel comfortable. Yeah, uh, and granted, this is mostly in the book because the film has to be a lot more family-friendly. So on the plane to LA, there's a progression of stewardesses and other ladies to tempt the boys. Plus, a softcore musical was shown on the plane's movie screen. Mark, Dave, and Bob look around nervously every once in a while to see if anyone is watching them watch it. Then they turn back to the screen. And obviously I think this is a reaction that anybody has if, any, if they're watching something remotely sexy on a plane. Like, you're, you're looking around because you're in such a public area. It's like, oh, like I was on a plane to the US and watching House of Cards. Yeah. And there is some, some sexy stuff appears in there. It's like, oh, hope that nobody's judging me. I had I read a um, Johnny Ryan book on a plane. Well, I started to. Do you know Johnny Ryan's an alternative cartoonist in America who um, does really crazy gross-out stuff? Mm-hmm. He's got like no filter. Oh, like he'll he'll do the most offensive thing possible for a gag, yeah. and he he does a lot of stuff that looks like old you know family circus kind of style gag strips, but mm-hmm. they'll just be really offensive. And I opened it up and saw one on the first page and then closed it up and put it away. I kind of want to say what it was, but then I don't want to say the words on the podcast. The other thing that I got from that excerpt, um, not from the one you just... <laughs> from, from the one the that book I just edited yeah, out. Yeah. Um, is that you don't really get uh, many softcore musicals out there, but I guess that Henry Edwards here is trying to establish that there is a market for the pulp that he is peddling. Now, you might think I'm being pretty useless on this episode, but this was where I thought, now I can do some research here. So I searched for softcore, uh, softcore musical, um, and there was a video site that sells videos, VHS tapes, and uh, it had one result for softcore mm-hmm. musical, and it was The Beach Girls from 1982. Okay. In this fairly innocent fair, some wild beach girls throw a super party to help a nerdy guy and an uptight gal get with the beach blanket <laughs> times. Though certainly not a shocker, this movie was rated R for nudity. 
There right. you go. And I watched a tiny clip and I saw someone's boobs. <laughs> Didn't see any music though, so. Well, I guess it's like high school musical in terms of there's not actually like we talk about having a musical, but we just you never know, see it. Never actually get around to it. High school yeah. musical. I think the third one might actually have a high school musical in it at the end. Well, they, th- they figured they probably should deliver at yeah, this point. Yeah, on the, on the promise. At, at some point, they're going to call you out if you're not bringing in the sunshine. <laughs> we come back to LA and the BD and Lucy are conniving as to who the boys should be seen with, like, to make them appeal to fans and be seen as, like, these happening stars. Seen so, as heterosexual. Yeah, as well, like, who their beards are. <laughs> um, not that the Bee Gees didn't have impressive <laughs> beards to yeah. begin with. They invented the beards. <laughs> yes. Um, so again, this leads Henry Edwards to have some more wishful thinking of listing female celebrities um, who he would like to appear in the film, and none of whom actually do. Yeah, Bette Midler. Yes. Well, I guess in the 70s was probably, you know, a bit of a hot number. Yeah, well, they, they cross over, they've got Bette Midler, I think they've got Olivia Newton-John is listed as well. I remember thinking Bette Midler was hot in the 80s, when she was on the cover of Outrageous Fortune with um, Cleavage. It was only a painting, though. But I still thought it was pretty hot. Mm-hmm. Uh, chapter five. Yeah. So after all this time, we're only at chapter five. Yeah, uh, um, an hour odd. Yeah. And the band finally get to LA, and they are met by BD and Lucy at the airport. And well, where to start with this? This is where Henry Edwards really starts getting sexy in I, inverted commas, and it's not subtle. I chose my favorite bit. Yeah. Lucy climbs out of the car and gets down on her hands and knees. Bob, baby, she purrs. Come out. I've got things to show you that are much more exciting than some dirty old car parts, she shimmies suggestively. Like some dirty old lady parts? <laughs> Weird. Y- yes. It's it's not subtle at all. And we get... like That's just one part of like five pages that we could have <laughs> copied out here. Um, we also get descriptions in L.A., of how seedy and terrible it all is. There's prostitutes, there's pollution, there's religious nuts, and we get more Bergonomics. Yeah, America's always telling us how they're the best country in the world, and their pop culture, like fiction, always tells us what a shithole it is. <laughs> On every corner, there's a fast food stand Duck Donald's, Jump in the Box, Hamburger Hustle, Todd's Little Girl, The Wiener, The Thousand and One Flavors, and one called Tacky Taco. Vendors approach the car, hustling their fast food in the streets. Dave grabs a tacky taco, but the stench makes everyone choke. BD dumps it out the window. It burns a hole in the pavement. <laughs> this really does have pockets of genius. I quite like some of the writing yeah. in this. I'm worried that the tacky taco though, would burn through your greaseproof pockets. Yeah, yeah. They might need some asbestos pockets. Uh, it would add to the flavour. Mm. Um, and... I've mentioned on several times that Henry Edwards has his favourite adjectives. He has the brashy and the silly and the cutie. When he's talking about breasts, they're either heaving or steamy. Yeah, I like that idea that breasts are hot, they're actually steaming. I think that's quite a quite an image. And be great in winter, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, there's a, monta- a lot of montages in the film. Um, not as easy to do in a, in a book. Yeah, um, yeah we, we've glossed over all the songs so far. Um, basically... Like, like any musical, we get the supporting cast each taking their own number and singing a song while stuff happens underneath it. So at this point, um, and this is most regrettable in the film, I think, um, we're, we're seeing the band come to terms with L.A. while Donald Pleasance and then Lucy um, sing I Want You, She's So Heavy. Um, if you've never heard Donald Pleasance sing, um, don't check it out. Don't Don't try and satisfy your curiosity it's basically imagining someone like Ray Winston growling <laughs> I want you I will slay your monster yes. I will slay it so bad um, and so over this one we're just getting a lot of opulence a lot of food a lot of wine a lot of hot shot music equipment because, yeah of course and then followed by another long list of uh, celebrities yeah lounging at the bar at Elton John Farrah Fawcett Majors John Travolta Barbara Streisand Sylvester Stallone Liza Minnelli Ringo Michelle Phillips Joni Mitchell and two of the Eagles they all wave and throw kisses at BD and gl- BD gleefully throws kisses back um, so Edwards here obviously loves Elton John because he's name dropped him so much in this film or in the book he must have been disappointed when he didn't end up in the film absolutely and I think it also just it sucks to be anyone in the Eagles here because they just like two of the Eagles. It doesn't matter which ones. I mean, problematic enough that you're in the Eagles, but still, you don't get named. 
It's so easy to have wonderful cameos in a novelization, <laughs> yes. isn't it? You can just like go, oh, lounging at the bar, eh? Char Puff and stuff. Jesus Christ, Cleopatra, a Pegasus, and Adolf Hitler. Yeah. They throw kisses at the Bee Gees. Yeah. Billy is actually showing some good business sense by not signing a horrible contract straight away. He wants to read it, but BD is impatient and basically gets um, gets Lucy to roofie him um, and make him sign it anyway. Um, so they've signed away their lives and they had their first recording session where, after a full start, they nail their first song in a single take because this is how the music industry works. Very fast. But, more importantly, we've reached the photo section. And it's awful. <laughs> And you did, it's black and white, um, it doesn't look like anything's happening. If anything in the movie, the colour and the costumes and uh, is the best thing in it, which yeah. is totally lost here. But you did uh, point out this uh, rather unique bit of um, photo section goodness. A blank space where a photo should be, <laughs> but the uh, caption is still there. Yeah, the photo appears several pages later without a caption. They've just not edited at all. They've yeah. just lost track of what's going on. Yeah, it's a bit of a mess. Yeah. Um, and I have a problem with one of the captions as well, and it comes back to a point that I mentioned earlier about how Heartland deals with death, but I'm going to get to that later because I don't want to spoil the, you don't want to spoil the, the story ending. for, for those, whatever value those the story people is. people that uh, managed to get all the way through. <laughs> yeah. Um, so after the photo section, which introduces all of the side characters um, that nobody cares about, we go back to the story. The album is finished in two hours. Um, and released the next day. Um, I'm not really sure how this is meant to be in the accurate depiction of the music industry. I mean, and another day later, like, seriously, the band's album and their single are both number one. Even though, like, the charts are done weekly for a start. But They had to change it because they were yeah. so popular. Yeah, it's like, this is the biggest band in the world. We will make everything just work according to them now. They're on TV. The people are watching at home in Heartland. Old Lady Pearl sighs, you turned me on, Billy, you always did, I'm glad I knew you, when Sarah, Linda and Ernest, Stuart and Linda and Bill and Zena looked embarrassedly at each other, weren't they silly to worry about what would happen to their boys when their boys hit the big time? Yeah, so to be clear here, their embarrassed looks aren't because an old lady is saying that their son turns her on. Oh, she's only human. Yeah. This is pretty bad. And the original boy band. Yeah, I mean, Billy, Billy is Peter Frampton here, he's got a very... Cool. Very fluffy, curly hair to Blonde mop. Point. Yes, he's all hair. Um, and then more computerette yeah. business. Yeah, they, they, they massage mustard. There's a lot of rubbing going on. It's yep. fairly gross. Um, and then, finally, plot happens. Mustard gets instructions to steal the instruments. I swear we were talking about mustard stealing the instruments like 40 minutes ago. But yeah. like it's going to happen now. Yeah, remember the magic instruments? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and amazingly, he does this successfully and then starts ruining Heartland. Worst of all, he converts the Heartland bandstand into Mr. Mustard's greasy mustard burger stand. Suddenly, the landscape of Heartland is dominated by a giant dripping greasy mustard burger sculpture. The Heartlanders stare at the hideous sight and then they finally realise they are doomed. And this is why you should always pay attention to the burgonomics. They really should have seen this coming. I reckon Americans would be quite resilient to this, that they, they could be worshipping a giant burger statue within minutes. Like, I think it would just take one really brave, influential soul, like, say, Oprah, for mm -hmm. example, to just go, Jesus, pretty good, but mm. uh, let's be honest. Cheeseburgers. Cheeseburgers. And then people would go, oh, fuck, I'm glad somebody <laughs> finally said it. And that would yep. be it. Yep. Change the money. Put drive throughs in the churches. Pretty sure you could have drive like They've got the architectural setup, a drive through church. You just have to actually just start selling the food. Yeah. yeah. I, th I think it's all ready to go. I You're just waiting chilling, for... Chilling vision of the future. Yeah, it, it, you just need targeted campaign. It's like Stop Coney, but for cheeseburgers. Let's get on to that. Yeah. Uh, finally, we get some... I hope unintentional fun with language here. I thought this was pretty good. Brute continues to throttle Billy as he fights off the Henderson brothers. With a few swift blows, Mark, Dave and Bob are wounded and bleeding. The Brute once again lifts Billy into the air. This time he will destroy him for good. Billy gasps. He is sure the end is in sight. Brute lifts, lifts him higher. As he does, the guitar slung over Billy's shoulder rubs against the buttons on Brute's clothes. A series of dazzling chords emerges from this combination of guitar strings and buttons. Brute swoons. He rubs Billy up and down against his body. The sound is magical. He rubs Billy even harder and harder and harder. I, oh. 
I, I like, we can't add anything to that. You can't fault Henry Edwards' imagination, though. Yeah. Like, he's having a grand old time <laughs> doing this, even if nobody else is reading it. He, like, he's got no shortage of ideas. Yeah. He, I, I think he felt restricted by having to write the screenplay and work within what would work on a cinema screen. He could just go to town on, in the book and just write what he really believed. I like that wilder stuff. I, I think that's kind of cool. Well, that's an interesting image. <laughs> And hey, it's especially remembering, like, it's a point we set out earlier in the, in the episode, but the film has no dialogue. None of the characters say anything or do anything <laughs> in the film. So he has to, like, set up these motivations and interactions um, and just, like, try and make sense of this all. It would have been interesting to see an author that hadn't re- re- written the screenplay try and make some sense of this. Yeah. Like, who wasn't already invested in that world and didn't already have ideas about what was happening, because mm-hmm. that would be a completely different book. Yes. All right, back to food. Yes. Um, L.A. isn't just junk food, but nobody actually cares about the non-junk food stuff. A small truck pulls up. Organic yogurt with sprouts and honey offers a smiling, long-haired youth driving the truck... Drop dead, Dougie growls. I don't want health, I want wealth. These are like your two alternatives in America. It's like, do you want to eat burgers like a hero or eat sprouts like a pussy? Mm -hmm. There's nothing in between. Yeah. The boys find out that the instruments have been stolen and Heartland is dying. Um, And Mustard has followed... Because Strawberry goes to LA to tell them. Mustard follows Strawberry. Then the boys get in Mustard's van and start looking for the instruments, leaving Mustard in LA. Um... They don't know anything about what's going on, so they find themselves with the computerettes. The computerettes see the obvious good looks of the Bee Gees and Peter Frampton and find themselves in lust immediately. So the boys essentially try to seduce the robots to try and get the locations of the missing instruments. Yeah, my I liked uh, Honey, You Can Turn On My Transistors Anytime. Oh. These are some horny robots. Yeah. Now look, this <laughs> is the bit. This is yeah. the good bit. Uh, chapter 9. Seriously, this is this is the bit that will stick in your memory forever. Even if you watch the trailer, you'll see this bit and you think, yeah, I should check out this scene. Yeah, seriously, if you're only going to watch one scene, this is the one to watch. This is Dr. Maxwell Edison, played by Steve Martin. This is kind of a precursor to him doing his um, dentist song in Little Shop of Horrors. Yep. And uh, he kills it. Yeah, I and mean, Maxwell Silver Hammer is one of the worst Beatles songs imaginable. And, like... It's still not good, but Steve Martin actually has some personality here. I loved it. I just, I was transfixed. This is amazing. Dr. Maxwell Edison is flanked by a small chorus of surgically attired cuties, each of whom wears the shortest of all possible smocks. This doctor doesn't look much like a doctor. He's too goofy looking. His eyes are crossed. He's got large buck teeth. He's got a crazy grin. Nevertheless, he's dressed in a glittering, glamorous surgeon's gown and wears a huge surgeon light on top of his head. He also carries a huge silver hammer that glistens in the light. And we find out some important character detail here. In the centre of his office is his valuable collection of cordless telephones and dead picture tubes. What a devoted collector he is. By fucking a sentence like that, that shows that the author has no consideration for his time, uh, no consideration for our time, and that you and I have no consideration (laughs) for the listener's time. Yes. Um, So we get backstory on Maxwell about how he was a bad doctor because he used to kill his patients. Um... So instead, like, for FB, FBB told him to do something else instead for his own crazy plan, so he uses his silver hammer to make old people young, um, and this makes Maxwell rich. So the boys finally get to his surgery and think of a plan to break in and steal back the magical saxophone that's there. So one of them suggests rushing in and taking it and shouting fire, so that when everyone evacuates they can, like, just take the, the instrument, or perhaps... Telling him, telling Edison that, well, we're gonna mess you up if you don't give us our saxophone, like, because that's such a threat. The Bee Gees are coming. The yeah, Bee Gees yeah. are coming. <laughs> um, and then we get this incredible plan. Bob boasts, maybe we should sing as we march in. They might be as crazy as that giant we subdued. Billy replies, it's possible. Even if they're not overcome by our sound, we could always use some new fans. It never helps. <laughs> ne- it never hurts. Networking. Yes. I mean, these are crazy guys, they're all loonies, but hey, we need them. They could, like, be presidents of our fan clubs. <laughs> um, but, but in the end, they end up uh, disguising themselves as old people. Yeah, only in the book. They don't do this in the film because they didn't have the budget for talcum powder. 
Um, and again, this is really just wishful thinking on Edward's part of what he could have achieved if he'd had free reign with the budget. Maxwell grabs a silver hammer. I'll break your head. I always said killing was better. He shrieks as he heads straight for Billy. Billy grabs another hammer. A fight to the death has begun. So, spoiler here. If no one dies, is it actually a fight to the death? No. Billy jumps onto an operating table and kicks Maxwell in the jaw. Maxwell falls backward. Billy grabs Maxwell's hammer. Now he has two. He pounds the doctor with one and Maxwell is suddenly 12. He pounds him with the other. Maxwell suddenly becomes eight. Those are some pretty weirdly calibrated reverse aging hammers. If these exist in the universe, then someone should seriously just beat the living shit out of George Burns. I reckon he could take like 30 or 40 blows easily. A great thing to have. George Lucas, if he had them. Well, no. I was thinking that if he had them, that would solve all of your problems with like doing Star Wars, like getting the old actors back. Like you could just make yeah, them younger. Yeah, do great for prequels. But George Lucas being George Lucas, he would probably just say, no, I don't need these guys. I'm just going to recast. Use these other people who are useless. <laughs> like, you have the hammers, George. Use yeah. the hammers. Um, and actually, in the film... When they're fighting with the hammers, there's a lot of Moog stuff going on in the background and there's lightning coming out of the hammers. It's, again, a little bit lightsabery because that's... A year the, after Star Wars. Yeah, it's what everybody did, like, to try and make it look sci-fi. Um, so in the book, we have an eight-year-old Steve Martin, like, biting them and chasing after them as they run off with the saxophone. In the, in the film, um, they knock out Peter Frampton and run away. And the they have just left with the saxophone and it's like okay cool we did that it happens yeah they get the instruments back spoilers yeah um but needless to say these aren't the smartest boys <laughs> only when they reach the van do they realize that they have retrieved only one of the four instruments there are three more to get back where are those three they must know now <sighs> <sighs> this is around the time i, I watched a little bit more I'll, I'll tell you when i stopped watching yeah um so of course to find out where the instruments are, we get more creepy robot seduction. Mark nuzzles Irma's neck. Irma tries not to respond. Each boy masters his charm. These computerettes must be made to help. All up in their USB port. <laughs> if the truth be told, it doesn't take much. Irma is fed up with those creepy, crawly bad guys, especially when these kids have such hot char sex appeal. I mustn't, she sighs. Mark whispers to her, I'll oil your, oil your shoulders if you help us. Suddenly, Irma beeps helplessly. Try the Temple of Electronic Cosmology. Oh, it's no Jumanji. That's true. It doesn't really roll off the tongue. So this is the last sequence I watched with uh, Father Son, which, again, visually, worth having a look at. This is yeah. um, Alice Cooper Yeah. in a creepy sphere. Yes, it is very Wizard of Oz, mm. um, is what they're going for here. Um, he's this big messiah, um, but he's the guy behind the curtain who's just slacking off. Um, but what we have is Billy nearly dying, um, and having, but he does, he goes into limbo and has weird dreams about Strawberry and Lucy, um, while, of course, Strawberry is singing Strawberry Fields Forever. Had to happen. Um, it, yeah, it was inevitable. You can't just set it up and then not deliver, um, even though it's, it's not the finest. Um, she but, loves him, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> You know, it's taken this long and we finally dropped a reference to a Beatles song oh, in yeah. there. It's like, we, we could have been, we could have planned this, we could have done it deliberately, just putting them in there for people to look out for, but no. I'm not an expert, I must admit. Uh, well, I know a bit. I, I've played, my Beatles experience mostly ev ev evolves around um, playing Beatles rock band with Greg and Jess. Yeah. Um, I've done that a few, few new years, and that's about it. If you have, um like father son and sexy robots why don't you have him like fucking them with here comes the sun uh plan <laughs> well it's weird because there's no father son song yeah like it, it, alice cooper sings because um instead of like sun king or or here comes the sun because they've wasted here comes the sun already um on like oh it's a morning time yeah people getting <laughs> up in the morning yeah Anyway, more sexy robots. Bob tickles Martha. Mark fondles Irma's nuts and bolts. Uh, Dave whispers sweet nothings to Barbara. But they're not getting any, any information out of the robots this time because Strawberry's there and they're jealous. What can she give him, snarls Barbara? I can rub your back, cook your dinner and figure out your taxes all at the same time. I mean, that's some really great countering of gender roles and subservience there by Henry Edwards. And I'm not sure I'd want to see that combo in action either. I, 
I don't want to like. I don't want to mix dinner and taxes. There are five things I look for in a woman. Uh, ability to do back rubs, ability to cook, uh, ability to do taxes, nuts, and bolts. So these women have it all covered. Yeah. They're made to deliver. Yep. Eventually, all of this attempts at flirting and seducing the robots leads them to self-destruct out of shame. Yes. Yes. Which I'm surprised um, Henry Edwards didn't do by this point in his yes. novel. I think he was having too much fun. Like he, it was written for him and him alone. Yeah, so look, they find the third instrument. Yeah, um, it was in the van all along. It was there, it was the drum, uh, and we go to a benefit concert. Yes, this is for the benefit of Mr. Kite, um, ostensibly, but it's mainly there to raise money to find the last instrument. Um, more importantly, though, so they all go back to Heartland, during this time... Mr. Mustard has been chasing them in a taxi yep. all this way. Um, and there's some really nice imagery here and really important backstory. Mr. Mustard and Brute sit in the back seat of the cab as it races towards Heartland. Mustard leans forward, pumping his body back and forth as if he were a rudder. They could increase the speed of the car faster, take shortcuts faster, he screams at the driver. The driver is an aging Hollywood extra who once doubled for Percy Kilbride in Mar and Parquet will go to Waikiki. He's not taking any guff. Call it, I was once in the movies, you know, he says to Mustard, and you look like a loser to me. I'm so losing steam <laughs> at this point. <laughs> yeah, it's... Why Why that was necessary, nobody uh, knows. Man, and the movie's the same. It's just such indulgent fucking guff. Like, yeah. if you just watch the Steve Martin, Alice Cooper, and then get the fuck out. <laughs> I, there is one bit I would recommend as well that's coming up. Um, spoilers, it's the ending. But uh, there's one bit I actually like. Um, this isn't in the film. It's just an amazing display of um, Los Angeles-style excess. I have to go to the bathroom, says BD. His limousine pulls up. BD never goes to the bathroom without taking his limousine. He usually keeps one car and driver in every room of every house or hardware store he's in. Hardware store? Guy just, he knows no one's reading at this point. And he's just like, oh, fucking... It's like one of those tests to see if you're listening. When you go, hey, you look nice today. Oh, do I? Thank you. And then you're like, uh, there's a crocodile in the kitchen. Is there? Thank you. And you're like, ah! Um, <laughs> and he takes the limousine to the bathroom, yeah. like, if he wants, like, I'm the driver. In, into the bathroom. Mm -hmm. I reckon if he wants real luxury <laughs> shits, he should just shit in the limousine. Well, if it were a luxury car, it would have a bathroom in it, and then all his problems would be solved. He could, he could have a hardware store in the boot. I would shit in the limousine, and instead of flushing, I would just set it alight. <laughs> That's excess. Yes. Um, Mustard is still in lust with strawberry. He can see it now. Strawberry and he happily sharing a hot dog bathed in mustard. Strawberry at one end, he at the other, both anxiously chewing toward the middle. American dream there. I think we've said that before as a joke um, when talking about Lady and the Tramp-esque yeah. American love scenes. And somebody beat us to it in 1978 when I was two. Yeah. And, and it featured Frankie Howard. I mean, really. And more important details... The cab pulls up to Heartland Town Square. Mustard and Brute jump out. The fare is $1,563.30. Mustard pays it. He gives the driver a nickel tip. Now, I know the point here is about how mean, like how stingy and awful Mustard is, but a nickel tip? That implies that he paid like 30 cents plus 5 cents in coins. And in the US, you don't use coins. They are useless. You use them for parking meters and laundry and that's it. You just give another dollar bill. Won't, like, a nickel buy you, like, a cheese... Like, five cheeseburgers in America? That's oh, in 78, maybe. <laughs> I, I guess I should make allowances for the time. <laughs> but seriously, I come back from the US with, like, a kilo of coins because yeah. I've not been able to use them. They multiplied when I was there as well. Yeah. Because they still use pennies. Yeah. There is no... It, there was one of the best things Australia did was outlaw the one and two cent coin. Just make it all easy. Yeah. Um, so... We, go, we finally get to the benefit, and this is where everybody just starts being evil because they can. Lucy and Dougie have, for some reason, teamed up to steal all the money, um, and they also rub all the bills against each other's bodies because that's hot. Um, they put the money in Mustard's van, but are caught by Mustard. Mustard then kidnaps Strawberry. Then FVB, you know, the master villain, who we don't know anything about, other than, like, it's a cult... Um, summons them to headquarters with all the instruments. Uh, so they head off. 
the boys notice them and chase after them in a hot air balloon. You've, you've described in this episode. You've described more plot than I think we've ever described on a show, and I still have no idea what is going on. Yeah, it's like Santa with muscles. Stuff <laughs> happened, and why? No. Um, so more the, importantly, is yes, we get we I'm get more interested food. in the food. Yes, so mustard is being chased by the hot air balloon, but. He still has time for breakfast. Mustard sits on the roof of his van at his breakfast table. A bound and gag strawberry faces him. At the table also a bound and gag Dougie and a bound and gag Lucy. The computer rats, I thought they blew up. Yeah, they got a, repaired. A lavish, oh fuck. <laughs> yes. lavish breakfast, freshly squeezed orange juice, curried eggs and bacon with a variety of hot rolls and jam, strawberries with fresh cream and coffee. But no mustard. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how he allowed it. Um... While this is all going on, Frankie Howard is ser- serenading everybody with "When I'm 64." Um, like it's directed at Strawberry. Like, like, will you still need me? Like, because I'm this creepy old guy. Yeah, he's 78. Yes, which is the ironic thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you ever, if you ever feel the need to check this out on YouTube, you once you see this bit or hear it, you cannot unhear it. it I was, was just sk- skimming through at this point. I yeah. think I missed this. Uh, you're very lucky. In the book, we also get him imagining. Like his love story with Strawberry, so he imagines her as the bride of Frankenstein or Mustardstein, who famously was not interested in the the man that she was created for. Yep, um, as Joan of Arc, um, and as a heroine tied to railroad tracks. Tell me you need me, he begs, or I'll let you die. What a peculiar kind of love is Edward's remark here. I'm not really sure that counts as love. No. Um, and he continues to hammer home his point. Yes. High in the sky, Billy, Mark, Dave, and Bob watch Mustard through binoculars. That fiend, Billy gasps. He's stuffing his face with strawberries. And he's got strawberry, says Mark. (laughs) (sighs) Don't rather stuff strawberry's face. (laughs) Finally, we get to FVB's lair. Yeah, and this there is some not-so-subtle messages strewn through this book. I, I might talk about them if I can be bothered at the end but one of them is about how money is evil um, yes and it, so we can tell that this is the super villain so if they're really interested in that sort of marketing George Lucas-esque synergy I don't know if uh, having an evil money is evil message is uh, particularly appropriate yes in its centre is a giant pyramid of money. Hundreds of youths wheel in barrel after barrel of money and paste the money onto the pyramid, much the way wallpaper is attached to walls. In case you're wondering like where wallpaper goes for a start, um, I'm not sure if this also counts as legal tender anymore once it's been pasted onto a pyramid. I don't understand the accumulation of money is money. Like I, Even when I have lots of money in my bank account, I'm like, it's just numbers unless I do something with it. Yeah. I don't know if sticking to a pyramid is uh, counts. I, I, I don't think they've understood pyramid schemes either. No, no, not quite how it works. Yeah. So um, FVB is revealed to be... The Future Villain Band. Oh, that's the worst kind of band. Yeah, as played by Aerosmith. <laughs> yeah! Um, and their leader is... This is the best name. Sal Future Villain. Yes, which is weird because he's kind of a current villain. Yes, um, and the description here is this band is the most unknown band in the entire history of the world and the most disliked it's pretty good if you're unknown and, and the most, most disliked, disliked yeah. um, they are meaner more tuneless and more arrogant than any other band has ever been sounds right I can, naive me but I honestly had no idea that Aerosmith was this old I was like aren't Aerosmith like a uh, like uh, yeah I had no idea they were in the 70s yeah well they, they'd written Walk This Way by this point yeah like, fuck I mean, they were several albums in I like, just it hadn't become a the, the big thing we run the MC obviously hey look we've heard about cuties we've heard about the grotesque but what about the smart people what, what, how are they dealt with in this thing well I don't want to like come back to all the old tropes but they're up to no good ah smart people yeah Sal may be smelly and filthy and have pins in his nose and a loose screw in his head, but he is smart. Very smart. I hate him already. (laughs) He was a major in psychology and computer technology and had graduated with honours. A brilliant boy! But all he wanted was rock and roll, and that was the one thing he couldn't have. It made him crazy. He also had rich parents. Parents who gave him anything so long as he didn't play that rotten music at home. 
Sal, future villain, decided to use his superior academic skills and his parents' wealth to brainwash himself the largest audience ever in the history of rock. Son of a bitch. Yeah. And this is a description of him. <laughs> Bathed in a harsh, cold spotlight, Sal is an extremely tall, pathetically thin, extremely unattractive creature as he barbarically dances on top of the pyramid. Steve Tyler, ladies and gentlemen. At least his daughter is hot. I, well, I wonder, really, if they wanted Mick Jagger for that one. <laughs> Although, um, yeah, that's the thing. Like, you look at Liv Tyler's lips and you look at Steven Tyler's oh. lips and then I think it would be hard to kiss her. <laughs> yeah, once on, once seen. Once you think of it, it's like, ugh. Uh, Mustard offers the instruments to uh, Sal Future Villain while Brute plants the dollar stake bearing strawberry into the huge mound of money. She's about to be offered up to a face worse than death. She will be Sal Future Villain's groupie! Yep, this is, like... Strawberry has no character whatsoever in this film. She is just nice and Billy's girlfriend. That is the extent of what she, what she, she has. She is the name of a song. Yeah, that, that, is how, that is her sole purpose of being here, and now she's going to be sold into sex slavery. Well, we might be 90 minutes in, but we at least we're, we're at the, the final confrontation pretty much here. Yes, this is the big set piece, because you know, we, we get all this set up for five minutes with the, um, with the supervillain. Um, the boys arrive and try and stop FBB. Billy confronts Sal, who orders his flunkies to kill him because he's nice. Billy hurls himself on the lead singer and begins to throttle him. This is indeed a fight to the death. Unlike that other one, which wasn't. True. Billy falls on his back. Sal grabs Billy's throat and strangles him mercilessly. Billy hangs over the pyramid, grasping for breath. Then he rears up and future villain lands on his back. The maddened musicians get up and begin to swing wildly. Billy heads for Sal and Sal knows Billy can take him. Will he be a god no longer? Or he will punish Billy for intruding. Sal picks up the dollar sign stake bearing strawberry, waves it around his head and then hurls it down from the pyramid. Down and down it goes until it lands at the base of the pyramid strawberry lies battered and dead no billy screams no sal then grabs billy by the throat suddenly billy has the strength of 100 men he lifts sal future villain over his head and hurls him from the pyramid sal lands directly on the stake his face a mere inch from strawberries billy lets out a blood curling scream who knew it would ever come to this who cared that it would come to this but I and mean, this is Hey, we're so far into the film and into the book, and we just have this completely unexpected tonal shift. Yeah. Like, oh, la 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 la, it's a bit weird, it's a bit camp, let's find the instruments. Hey, let's kill her. Yeah. And it's like, and it, like, the, the Aerosmith are playing come together during this whole scene, and then she dies, and it's just, the music stops. It's just silence. When I was scanning through, I did see her in a big glass coffin, a la yeah. Snow White, and I was like, oh, shit, something went down. Yeah, well, she did. Upstairs. <laughs> Ouch. Um, so in the book here, future villain has clearly murdered Strawberry. Um, and this is the point I want to come back to with the photo section. The missing caption, yep. yeah. Well, well the, the, the other caption. Yeah, the caption on the photo at the funeral, um, so Strawberry's funeral happens in a moment, um, says, Heartland's heart breaks after Strawberry Fields sacrifices herself for the boy she loves. Now, she was kidnapped. Yes. She was about to be sold into sexual slavery as Steve Tyler's groupie. And then she was thrown to her death. But no, we Heartland doesn't understand murder, so this was clearly her actions. She had agency, and she sacrificed herself. They've been blinded by rainbows and kindness. Yeah, all that sunshine has done something to their brains. Um, in the film, it's a little bit different, because while Sal and Billy are fighting, Strawberry tries to pull Sal off Billy and helps make him unbalanced, so he, he falls first, but then she has momentum and falls, and she's chained to this big dollar sign, so she falls down the stairs as well and dies. But still... This wasn't a deliberate act. She did not sacrifice herself. I just find it, like... The un the way that death is dealt with here is just so... Cavalier. Yes. Is an excellent word for it. Um, so we return for the funeral. Yeah. The, the instruments are safe. But, you know, it turns out we didn't care. Nobody's happy here. I'm not happy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're finally... We're into the final 20 minutes of the film. In the book, this happens in seven pages plus padding. Um, but... It takes 20 minutes because there are so many songs to fit in. <laughs> All the sad songs. Yeah. But it means also that um, Henry Edwards pretty much says nothing here because it's all just lyric, paragraph, lyric, paragraph. Um, and so we finally get to the ending. Yes. Um, which is pure deus ex machina. It shows how little any of this counts. So to set it up, Billy is distraught that Strawberry's dead and doesn't want anything more to do with this world. He's fed up with this world. So he decides to commit suicide while Barry Gibb is singing A Day in the Life. 
as you do. Uh, Mark Henderson quietly composes a song that sums up his feelings about how rotten the world is when someone as beautiful as Strawberry dies. You know, a song about how many holes it takes to fill the Albert Hall kind of works there. Probably not. Um, so Billy climbs into Strawberry, goes into Strawberry's house and jumps from her window. As he's doing that, the Sergeant Pepper weather vane spins around and Sergeant Pepper comes to life. Yes. He's like standing on top of this church or town hall or whatever. He sings Get Back. He points his finger at Billy and makes magic happen and Billy flies back into the room. Yeah, when I was flipping through, I saw this black guy singing Get Back to Where You Once Belong and yeah. he pointed and Strawberry like appeared out of nowhere and was alive again. Yeah, well, it's what Sergeant Pepper here, he's cleaning up all the mess around Heartland. So he's just pointing his finger and magicking like getting rid of all the mustard signs. He turns mustard into an altar boy and Lucy into a nun and... Uh, puts just... all the women back in the kitchen yes. in the 70s. Yeah, puts all the ice cream back in the freezer. <laughs> um, th- it's really weird as well with the film because like they've set up who Sergeant Pepper is at the start. Like They show him on screen when he dies. And so the weather vane is meant to be Sergeant Pepper, but it's Billy Preston. Like It's, it's not this old white guy anymore. It's, you know... Billy Preston, who's a black musician. That's why I was confused. Yeah. yeah. But, I, I thought it was Lando Calrissian, but mm. that's fair enough. Well, Bill, and Billy Preston is basically, he is the most Beatles connection in this film because he actually, like, he played on Get Back. He's the one playing the keyboards. Like, he was there before he nearly became a Beatle. So he gets to sing his song. This is my favourite part of the film, just because he, he looks like he's come from a completely different film. Like, he's just teleported in for this one thing he is having fun yeah he did a he's, good job and he's he just, sings the hell out of it he's just cleaning up all this shit yeah Sergeant Pepper points his finger once again the newly dug ground at Heartland Cemetery rises and miraculously begins to part Strawberry's coffin flies open Strawberry steps out alive beautiful and young once again Billy can't believe his eyes he scoops <laughs> yes. her into his arms Sergeant Pepper hugs his grandson and soon to be granddaughter he stands on the bandstand next to Billy Mark Dave and Bob Strawberry went back into the kitchen at this point or coffin yep. they oh. all began to play uh, the Heartlanders pour into the town square at the sound of the music they are all dressed in black and then hey, we can't read out the ending because the ending here is insane. Billy, um, Henry Edwards has done something truly magnificent, perhaps, or just wrong. Um, oh, he, fuck me, yes. Yeah, he, he might not have won a Pulitzer, but I think we can bestow on him the... Um, well, he's certainly self-nominated, at least, for the Bruce Bethke Padding Award. Yeah. Um, it, like, for, for me, it's it's like he heard the Have You Seen My Records part of LCD Sound Systems Losing My Edge and thought, no, I can do better. So, Sergeant Pepper smiles. There is a crash of thunder. Be the stars of your dreams, says Sergeant Pepper, and suddenly they are. In their imaginations, they are all the stars who have made music great. Stars like Stevie Wonder, The Rolling Stones, The Who, Led Zeppelin, Aretha Franklin, Elton John, David Bowie, Diana Ross, Fleetwood Mac, The Average White Band, and on and on and on. You're we not get... wrong. It, it, it's literally about five pages just of names. Yeah. In so, small print. Yeah, just paragraph after paragraph. We the, get... the Ramones. Yeah. Gil Scott Heron appears, which is good. We get Wings um, the... for the Beatles fans. Yoko Ono does not make an appearance. Hot chocolate. Yeah. Um, Alvin and the Chipmunks are there. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's some... my favourite. <laughs> um, it's it's actually quite it's quite interesting because they have a lot of jazz musicians. They've got a lot of female artists. It's quite representative, which is surprising. Um, but... Meat, meatloaf. Oh, really? Mm. Oh, dear. Um, so, yeah, we just get five pages of names. Um, and eventually we get to... Brian Ferry, Ten Years After, Black Sabbath, The Kings, Jackson Brown, Hart, Kiss, and Bob Seger, and Peter Frampton, and the Bee Gees, and George Burns, and Paul Nicholas, and Aerosmith, and Alice Cooper, and Earth, Wind, and Fire, and Steve Martin, and Billy Preston, and Elvis, and the Beatles, and many, many more. Sergeant <sighs> Pepper raises his baton. He smiles at Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, the biggest, the most talented, the happiest, the most loving band you will ever see. No music will ever be sweeter than the music this band will make today. Everybody joyously begins to sing. One, two, one, two, three. And then they flip in reprise Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band again for like the fifth time in the film. It's 20 years ago today that Sgt. Pepper taught the band to play. They've been going in and out of style, but they're guaranteed to raise a smile. And that's the most of the song we can say without having to pay copyright. To the Beatles. Yes. Um, all right. So that's how it ends. Oh. Like in the film, Whew. 
in the film, the ending is essentially like that. It has a cavalcade of stars, and from what I read, the producers sent invitations to everyone they could think of to come down and be part of the Our Friends at Heartland chorus for the final number. So they're, like, they're clearly not on location anymore. They're in front of a green screen or mm. in front of a picture of the, of the town hall um, in the style of the Sgt. Pepper album cover. So they just sent out in- invitations to everyone saying, hey, come down, we'll give you lunch. Um, unfortunately, they couldn't quite get the caliber of star from the five-page wish list, although there's some big names there, like Curtis Mayfield. Um, but for Australian fans, they did get Dame Edna. I did see Dame Edna. I did watch the end. I saw Dame Edna in there, and I was very thrilled. Because Barry Humphreys, at that point, would come along for a free lunch. And was billed as, uh, as Barry Humphreys yes. in the credits. Uh, um, okay. <laughs> and that's, that's the film. That's the book. It's ridiculous. Um... <laughs> Wow. So this yeah. is our longest episode ever. Yeah, sorry about no, that. That's good. Look, if you're going to have the longest episode ever, with Tim the Statsman, <laughs> and it's very appropriate. So um, I've got to ask Tim, as I ask everybody <laughs> at this point, very serious, there's a listener that gets really annoyed if we don't do this bit. Wait, who's that? Oh, well, someone very <laughs> dear to you, close to you. Uh, was the book better? I have pondered this question for a long time. I watched. The, I got this book last year, and I watched the film for the first time last year. I mean, I've been dipping in and out of both of them since, trying to come up with an answer. I think my answer is, whichever one I'm not watching or reading at the time, the other one is better. Because um, they're both is terrible. Is going to fuck up your chart? No, I, I have an actual answer. But that's that's, that's, yeah, that's uh, my gut feeling. Right, yep. and it's like, I don't want to be doing either of them. Like, the, the movie has the songs... But the songs are terrible and the acting is bad. The book is... The book, you don't have to listen to the songs. But some of the descriptions are just terrible. In the end, though, I think I'm going with the book. Because although I don't like Henry Edwards' voice, he has a voice, he has some personality, and he does something interesting with it. So, whereas the film is just... Like, it's, it's bland and camp, and it's okay to have in the background, but you don't want to pay attention to it because you just kill your brain but at least you can sort of channel in the film while doing something else which yeah. is hard to do with a book so I'm going to go yeah. with the film because I would at least recommend watching that Steve Martin scene yeah. and a little bit of Alice Cooper as well yeah but those are the, the take out, takeaway bits the problem is with the rest of the film then you have Frankie Howard singing When I'm 64 or Peter Frampton completely failing to act people with hot dogs dripping with mustard sticking out of every orifice in their body well that's in the book <laughs> Yeah. Um, Amazon reviews. Not yes. much. I have loved this book since shortly after it came out. Like the movie, I have no problem starting it over after I finished it. I've read it at least 50 times over the years and have to stop myself from starting it a third time in a row so I can get other things read and done. It is an enjoyable book that was written by the same guy who wrote the screenplay. He did a great job on both. Fuck you. <laughs> he really did not. You are wrong. <laughs> that is sick. Yeah. Oh. But like that reminds me of the story where it wasn't like some kid go up to Alec Guinness and go, well, I saw Star Wars like 50 times, and the Alex Guinness just like fucking slapped him, <laughs> threw him down a flight of stairs or something. Ah, uh, yes. And um, it's some reviews on Goodreads as well. Two, this one's interesting. I am in it. A lady who worked with my mom in television was the provider of the sub-stories and sub-characters for this book, those not in the screenplay. Her name was Ellen, and she became Teacher Ellen in the book with the big melons. Yes. Uh, Some of the townspeople were Farmer Chris, Drummer James, and Brash Peter, which are the names of my brothers and me. Even Sergeant Pepper's parents were named after my own Harry and Eleanor. Isn't this interesting? This sounds yeah. to me like um, Henry Edwards like was rooting this girl and said, you can uh, make up some names in my book because he had yeah. no shortage of ideas. Yeah. Well, well, I, like, he, he just, I just need some information. Hey, I'll put you in the book if you help me out. If you help me out with this little uh, hot dog problem. <laughs> uh, and this is uh, the true, one true review. Yeah. One of the worst books ever written goes along well with Astonishingly Bad Movie. Amen. Yeah, put that on the poster. Seriously. Holy shit. Well, um, next week I think it'll be Robin Hood. Uh, Mm -hmm. I've I've got to get onto that. Just since it was prepared, I was not. But um, hopefully (laughs) I'll get my shit together. And that will happen. Thank you so much, Tim. Well, I have to say, I'm contractually obliged to say that it's been wonderful to be here. It certainly was a thrill. And I never want to listen to that song ever again. (laughs) I think I will now, actually. No no Beatles on Spotify, unfortunately. No, well, they, they, they Apple... Apple Core, the Beatles company, don't get on well with having 
music on the internet. Yeah. The, the, like, the famous one. I, there is a lot I could have said about this film. I have a lot of thoughts about it, but, eh, let's talk about hot dogs and hamburgers instead. Well, um, on the old uh, Facebook page, the Book Was Better page, come along and um, we can continue the discussion there. I'd be curious to know if anybody has seen this or has any other opinions on this as well. Well, well, they should. It's, it's all on YouTube, so they could go and check it out and suffer through or fast forward an hour and ten minutes or whatever to Steve Martin. And, and uh, yeah. And hey, so, there, there is a three-minute trailer. The, the whole theatrical trailer is three minutes long and has choice highlights including Maxwell Silverhammer so you could just watch that sounds just about the right length and also I want to encourage people to listen to um, FP cast because mm-hmm. like a lot of people listen to book was better we're always in the charts but um, FP cast is still you know it's fledgling but we've done 40 episodes we've got into our routine now I think it's uh, it's Jacinta and I are the permanent hosts now and um, I, I think it's a lot more fun and and uh, you should like where we're going. So give that a try. If you like Book Was Better, it's pretty similar these days. And our next episode, or the one from yesterday, is about uh, nudity in films. So uh, check that one out. Tim, anything else you want to say, plug, do? Uh, I have one thing, actually. Um, This is episode 85. Yes. Um, So the next round of stats I'm going to unleash, which, given the last ones were like 100 pages long, will be (laughs) like in three volumes plus appendices. Um, will be after episode 100. Yes. And so I'm interested in getting any listener comments, like, particularly just getting some short comments, like, tweet length, 140 characters, about favourite episodes, like, just short summaries I could throw in there. Um, They don't have to be about... Like, they could be, you could put in as many as you like. You don't have to do one episode. You could write a comment for all 85 so far if you wanted. But just, like, having some listener feedback I could throw into the stats as well, just to make it... A bit different to last time. That would be very cool. And um, Jess and I are going to have to start planning what the uh, big 100 is going to be. Uh, so any ideas on that would be good as well. We welcome um, if there's a book or something that you're kind of hoping that we're doing that's going to be 100 worthy. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, you can do the honours. Oh, well, you should pressure now. Yeah. Well, th- thank you very much for having me, Luke. And we will catch you on the flips. Chimaji! Thank you.